Okay, so today we are going to uh, continue on with our uh, discussion that was somehow centered around uh, second order systems. You remember last time we specifically spent uh, a whole lecture discussing two topics. One was uh, eigenvalue analysis of second order systems, <clears throat> where we were worried about stability but also the type of solutions that we can produce, right? Oscillatory solutions, solutions without oscillations, critically dumped solutions. And we also were worried about uh, frequency analysis a little bit. Uh, specifically, we could uh, describe what happens at specific frequencies with the system. And we learned that there exists something called natural frequency which without damping causes a resonance, okay? So all those effects are specific to second order systems and they are quite uh, easy to describe exhaustively, right? So uh, eigenvalue analysis can be done for any system, but for second order system, we more or less have exhaustive analysis, okay? And you remember second order systems is most of what we uh, deal with in this uh, course. So like DC motors, if you go to something like simple models, spring mass damper, simple linearized models, which become effectively spring mass damper, such as pendulum uh, at a uh, linearized around certain position and so on, right? So it is, uh, or RL circuit, uh, RLC circuit, right? So uh, a lot of stuff uh, here kind of becomes a second order system. That is why this analysis is important. So now we go from analysis to control. We are going to start uh, trying to apply our understanding to uh, control what we uh, have, right? So to shape the dynamics instead of just describing it. And uh, understand that for most of you, hopefully, uh, you have uh, background in control, which uh, allows you to answer questions such as, given a linear system, how do I design control for it, right? Uh, your background in control should already give you answer to this question. Right? To, and uh, in a sense, uh, when you have this background, it almost feels like, well, PID control, the whole idea is kind of strange because uh, we already know how to control a system in state space. So why do we need this strange beast, which, uh, somehow has derivatives, integrals, it seems strange. But at the same time, as soon as you talk with the engineer who comes from um, you know, practical applications, uh, works in uh, somehow with automation design, it can be design of low level circuits in uh, control systems of robots, it can be just a person who works with motors, it can be a lot of other specialists. You would hear from the conversation that the PID is more or less a workhorse, which everyone acknowledges as a basis, right? Uh, there is no question of uh, doing, let's say, LQR uh, or something like this uh, as a default. There is a, always PID that becomes a default. And uh, this might be historical, this might be just a, you know, how practice developed. Fact of the matter is, it is how uh, it is. How it is. And uh, today's lecture will see what PID is. It is critically important for you to understand uh, since it is everywhere in practice. But also I will try to show you why it is uh, so good, right? It is not a bad choice that people do because they lack education. That's uh, definitely not the correct attitude. Uh, there is a reason why PID is popular. And I will try to show you um, exactly what uh, PID um, does for us, right? But we'll try to stick to our mathematical background. So uh, in a different course uh, with a different instructor, uh, and uh, you know, that is like one of those things which I recommend. You know, if you can, uh, if you're interested in topic, try to listen to someone else, not just one professor, right? In a different course, you would have a discussion of PID uh, coming from practical perspective, how to tune gains, what it means, etc. Uh, here I will try to give you a uh, more theoretical perspective. So please be aware that I'm not giving you all possible ways to look at PID. All right, all right. 
So hopefully we will feel motivated that you actually need to listen to the donation. Now we will proceed. Okay. So PID, uh, as I said, is uh, one of the most standard and widely used control laws. Okay. Especially, especially, its applications are ex appears to be extremely uh, suitable for things like single input, single output control. So we're not talking here about something like quadrota control, where you have at least six inputs. You know, it could be uh, you know it could be different number, but let's say six inputs, so coordinates of a floating body, right? And the outputs of the controller should be four. So you know, other way to say it is uh, four control inputs, six measured outputs, right? Just as an example, uh, this is not a famous uh, application of PID, even though I'm sure there is no problem of applying PID for uh, quadrotor. People, to my experience, applied pretty much everything to quadrotors. PID is uh, ubiquitous when it comes to simple systems such as a motor, motor with uh, some sort of internal circuits. Uh, often enough, for example, you would find uh, a motor which is controlled by voltage as uh, you probably remember from our lectures uh, two and three weeks ago. But the motor does not allow you to directly uh, input a voltage <clears throat> because it already has an internal circuit which uh, takes a reference current and make sure that you have this current flowing through the windings, right? And how it does it? often by PID control or something equivalent, okay? So often you would have, uh, often you would have low level control uh, uh, circuits, uh, okay? Uh, like, and they are often done via PID. For example, if you saw walking robots like quadrupeds, there would be PID controllers in, on the level of a motor, and then uh, there will be PD controllers uh, a little bit higher on the level of uh, distribution of forces and so on. So there will be, uh, you know, at the lowest level, you would often find those uh, PID. All right, also, uh, yeah, okay. So that is, that is it, that's it. A low level control loops, that is very typical application for them. Uh, also, it is uh, appears especially important for stabilizing control. Um, uh, why do I say stabilizing control? Well, often enough, you have a tracking control. Tracking is when you uh, follow a reference uh, signal. <clears throat> All right, that is uh, a possibility. Right, uh, you want to track uh, a signal. Here, uh, you can use PID, of course, and the people use it all the time for those type of applications. Uh, but uh, sometimes it, uh, we sort of prefer to track signals which are comparatively slow. So the behavior is uh, still kind of like a little bit like stabilizing control. Also, there is a point-to-point -point control. For point to point as in when you have coordinates here and you say move here, like a big distance away. This again is an uh, area with its own uh, set of problems we find ways to do it. But for stabilizing control, this appears to be just perfect, right? Uh, shipping frequency response, right? That, uh, that appears to be quite typical uh, application for PID control. That's what we talked about yesterday, remember? Frequency response. Uh, There's uh, also shipping performance and step response. That is something we didn't talk yet about. And that is uh, what happens when you give you, that's basically, you can start, think of step response as step point-to-point uh, -point control, when you say, okay, now from uh, zero second, you have to um, get, uh, you get as input one instead of zero. So you have like your voltage, let's say, or your reference or whatever becomes one. You have to follow it and uh, we, we want as, uh, as good behavior as possible. That is where uh, PID excels. Even the robust control, what is also interesting, uh, PID is good at. So those things, mm -hmm. that is where you would often find uh, PID. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
Notice proportional derivative control is quite similar, or well, it just sums one letter, like the result integral part. And this proportional derivative control would have a lot of same properties. And it is uh, without robustness. And it is widely used in theoretical research. So the connection between PID and PD is very close. And this allows a lot of intermixing, like a lot of theoretical research which relies on PD control. You can sort of find connection with PID. So <clears throat> it is not like there is complete dissonance between practical PID controllers and uh, a lot of theory which results in what appears to be quite close to PD. Okay. All right, and uh, we will see uh, quite a bit of it today, right now. All right, so yeah, talking finished. Now let's go into math. I think that will be much more clear. All right, all right. So let's consider uh, our favorite DC motor. Okay. Let's remember from uh, two lectures ago, three lectures ago, we managed to rewrite dynamics of this motor as this second order system, right? So we managed to rewrite it as this second order uh, system. Okay. Now, what is interesting about this system is that we could notice that there is a variable in front of uh, omega double dot, variable in front of omega dot, variable in front of omega, right? Okay, there is also a variable in front of u. As you probably recognize, we could very easily divide by this variable everything. So we would have one here. Everything else will be just the same by divided by gl. Right? Both g and l are non-zero. If g was zero, uh, sorry, if j was zero, then uh, inertia of the motor shaft would be zero. That is non-physical. If L was zero, there will be no induction in the coil of your uh, motor windings. Again, non-feasible, and it would be a motor. It would be just to be a resistor. So we can always, that is not a zero. So we can always divide by it, and we can introduce a change of variables. Like we can describe this divided by this as this guy, right? So it would be uh those two th like this divide by this gets you this guy and this divide by this gets you this guy right? and finally this divided by this gets you this guy right? <clears throat> so we can introduce a change of variables and uh after the change of variables what we have is a new controller that looks like this omega double dot plus a omega dot plus c omega equals to B U, okay? Now this is a new system that we get. Okay, all right. So now the dynamics of the motor is just a second order differential equation with uh, one in front of the highest order derivative, everything else has a coefficient. Nice, uh, you know, very good looking system. Okay, now we want to control angular velocity omega. So remember, omega is uh, angular velocity here, right? Just a reminder, uh, Emma, uh, just in case you forgot what those things mean, let me quickly remind you. Uh, this is inertia of the motor. This is uh, the induction coefficient of your coil. This is, um, let me make sure I don't say anything wrong, because this is a friction coefficient uh, for viscous friction. This is uh, resistance. This is your back AMF coefficient. This is your torque coefficient. So those are the things. Okay. And uh, omega is angular velocity of the motor. Okay. Now, to control angular velocity, we propose a PD control. PD control. Okay. Right. PD control. So the control law for the PD control would look like this. Uh, let's understand why it is a PD control, proportional differential control. Well, here is a proportional term. 
So u is proportional to omega times the co linear coefficient. Okay. In this case, it is uh, all of those are constants. So this linear coefficient is just a scalar. Okay. All of, sorry, not constant scalars. So all of this is scalars. There is no vectors here. This uh, is a derivative coefficient. So it is a derivative of omega times uh, a coefficient. And that is u, right? u is equal to, you know, par something proportional to our values that we control and something proportional to the derivative of this value, right? Some of those elements. Those minus signs have to do with uh, just a convention. Like we could do it uh, without, uh, like with a plus. Uh, it is a quite typical to do plus in optimal control. But in classical control, as in stuff that is similar to linear control theory, uh, in introductory robotics, in PD control in this area, typical to use minus sign. Purely convention, purely convention. This minus sign will just uh, define the sign of those two coefficients. That is all. Like it's uh, completely irrelevant uh, what sign you use. You just need to make sure that your after you chose your signs, everything else you know follows it. Right? Okay. Now uh, we chose this control law. Okay. Why we chose it? Okay. Let's uh, leave it for now. But we chose. It. We can substitute it now into our previous expression, like into here, basically, right? We can substitute here. Let's do it. What we get is this new expression where we have our control that we substitute, right? And we have uh, a coefficient here, B, okay? This, that is what was multiplying Q, if we and we have our dynamics here. So this is uh, what our dynamics looked like uh, on the left-hand side. <clears throat> so this didn't change, right? This, uh, you can say, also didn't change. All right, all right. Now we have, <coughs> there's a question form, which looks very similar to second order uh, differential equation again. Just uh, variables are on both sides. So let's transfer all of them to the left-hand side and group them uh, accordingly. So then we would have um, A plus B, K, D in front of uh, omega dot and C plus B, K, P in front of omega. This makes perfect sense. B was the control coefficient. K, P is uh, in front of omega. So we would have in front of omega Kp times control coefficient plus c, which was there to begin with, right? Like this c plus this b k, uh, sorry, plus this b kp, right? This is what we have here. Same here. So I think this is quite clear. There is uh, nothing mysterious about what we uh, see here. All right. So we got our second order dynamics again. Now we have just more variables. Here is what is interesting. With what we just did, we arrived back at um, second order dynamics, which we were able to analyze exhaustively before, remember? We were able to tell for this type of equation, when will it have um, damping sufficient to prevent oscillations. So when eigenvalues are purely real and negative, okay? When <clears throat> those oscillations start, so when the eigenvalues will be negative with some imaginary parts. This depended on determinant, you could say, right? Uh, all right, over the quadratic equation. We could uh, analyze uh, what will it take for the system to be stable, to have negative eigenvalues in real parts negative, right? <clears throat> All of this we could analyze. And now we could do the same, but with those coefficients K, P, K, D. So we could, in fact, clearly have analytical description of how big K, P, and K, D would need be to serve any of those purposes, right? Also, we could do frequency analysis 
uh, the way we did before. Uh, if un unless uh, unless this whole coefficient, let me show it uh, in color. Unless this coefficient is zero, we're not going to have reason resonance, right? So this uh, guy would have to be uh, like if it is positive. Oh, sorry, if it is negative, then we just have unstable system. You remember that's again from the last lecture we proved it. If it is positive, we cannot have a perfect resonance where a system has infinite oscillations. But uh, we could, uh, using this coefficient, shape the border plot, uh, which uh, natural frequency would depend on this guy, right? It would depend on this guy. And we can use this guy to shape how far the body plot would have go at the natural frequency, etc. So basically, with PD control, the advantage which you can instantly see is that uh, for second order system, our entire analysis can be used to uh, analyze the effect of KP and KD. Right? And they can choose them accordingly. So there is absolutely nothing that stops us. So here's an example. Here's an example. Let's consider this type of a system. Let's imagine that this is description of some kind of a motor. Uh, the values uh, 2 and 5 and 0 0.5 may be not, uh, you know, the perfect ones, but they're easy to work with. So I just chose. Okay. So, okay, nice system. Let's say I want to turn it into something like this. So I want to turn the system into omega double dot plus 5 omega dot plus 10 omega equal to 0. Why do I like this system? Well, uh, maybe I like it because eigenvalues are nice. Um, I know it is stable because both 5 and 10 are positive numbers. Right? Remember again, last lecture, we found out that if both of them are positive, system is stable. Right? Could be other reasons. Right? So I want uh, the system to look like this, to look like expression uh, here. OK, how do, I, how do I do it? Well, I remember after we substitute control law, after we substitute control law, what will happen is uh, we would have here on the array, right, 0 0.5 times AP times omega plus uh, 0 0.5 times KD times uh, omega dot. Okay. That's what we are going to have on the right-hand side of this equation after we substitute control law. So after we uh, next group the terms, uh, what we would have is double dot omega, right? Plus two plus uh, zero point five times kd times dot omega, right? Plus uh, five plus uh, zero point five AP omega equal to zero, right? Equal to zero. Right? So this is what will happen after we substitute this control law and uh, move everything to the left hand side. So it means actually we just need to uh, look at the this expression and make sure it is equal to five, right? Here it is, it has to be equal to five. And this expression has to equal to 10, right? So this expression has to equal to 10. And from this, we instantly find what KD and KP should be. Uh, KD should be, in this case, six, right? Six times 0 0.5 is three, two by plus three is five, and KP should be 10. 10 times uh, one half is five, five plus five is 10, all right? So the control law that does it is this. So you can see how easy it is, right? And um, it, it all depended on us being able to formulate how we want the system to uh, appear. And this is quite easy because for example, let's say you have a, uh, you use natural frequency representation. You can decide what natural frequency you want. You can decide what, um, damping uh, coefficient you want, right? This um, uh, attenuation coefficient, right? 
you can have you can decide both of them and uh, then you get uh, your OD in this form which you wanted right then all you need is to solve those two equations and uh, voila here's your answer right sounds very tempting and uh, this <laughs> in a very simplified way explains to you why pd is so Nice, right? And why we love what we call pole placement. This is actually pole placement, right? What I say is, but instead of doing it as a, in terms of poles, I just do it in terms of coefficients of the OD, which is, you know, fair enough. It's not illegal. In the case of second order systems like this, it is not illegal. If we did it in state space form, it would be much easier to ask for something possible uh, because state space has four <laughs> coefficients in front of a, so in front of x, and only two uh, coefficients can be tuned. Here we have two coefficients, right? So much harder to ask for impossible things. Okay. So as you can see, uh, PD boils down to basically just uh, making those what appears to be like high school style calculations how to make uh, one equation to another by those like substitutions and so on. Right? Quite simple, quite simple. And uh, being armed with analysis, you can instantly understand why it is nice to do this kind of stuff. You know, you can link it to performance. Okay, so, so far so good, so far uh, so good. Now, this is not a, the only way we use PD control. So often we want the controller to fi, uh, follow a reference signal. And mentioned it in the beginning of the lecture, right? A reference signal. Now, um, a reference signal, you can think of it as a, people often think of it as a solution to the, and one of the particular solutions to the ODE. There are other ways to do it, but uh, for simplicity, if you just want to imagine it, uh, in, not in mathematical terms, but in engineering terms, imagine you have a user that kind of like has a stick controller. User tells you, okay, go here, go back. Let's say each motion, each movement of the stick produces you some kind of signal that you need to follow, like a C-shaped curve to go from one place to another. Or something else, like a piece of trajectory, basically, that you need to follow. Like if you are thinking of an industrial robot, your tool head of your robot, like your, what do you call them, and the factor has to follow a trajectory. Good. This trajectory is your reference signal. For your single motor, reference signal is just a piece of reference signals for all the motors of your robot, right? So reference signal. Good. So control law in this case will take uh, this form. Just take it, uh, it's not a derivation, I just propose. Like, let's make it take this form. Notice minus sign from here is now here, right? So minus signs disappeared inside the brackets. Uh, but the, the, it, nothing changed. It's just that we have uh, positive components here. Right, this is a positive component. And as, as before, we have a negative component. So a new positive component, old negative component. So, so there is no tricks with science. Science remained as before. We just added more stuff. OK, and so now what, what it appears to be is this. We have a coefficient, Kp, which multiplies the difference between the reference signal and the desired angular velocity. We have a coefficient Kd which multiplies the difference between the derivative of the reference signal and derivative of the angular velocity. We call those differences often tracking errors. So this can be called tracking error. So how badly we track the signal, how much error we make in our tracking. So this is a tracking error. Also, we can call it a discrepancy. Also, we can call it control error. All three are perfectly fine. Control error is, uh, I guess, more control theoretical, I would say. Tracking error is maybe more robotic. All right. So we have this difference, control error, let's say, multiplied by Kp, derivative of control error, multiplied by Kd. Okay. 
Now let us do exact same thing we did before. We take our equation here. Oh, sorry. We take our equation here and we substitute into it our control law. Our control law. Let me mark it as a different color. Okay. So control law appears here. Here is a control law. And uh, the rest is just old equation. The rest is just old equation. What happens here? Uh, what happens here? Uh, well, we open the brackets and we move everything related to omega to the left hand side. But this time, this time, we leave everything related to the reference signal on the right hand side. Why do we do this? Well, if you remember your uh, ordinary differential equation course, you maybe remember that uh, what um, what what this is. If you look at it, uh, let's uh, yeah. What this is is um, basically ordinary differential equation, which is non-homogeneous. So you have terms which are in the variable in which the equation is constructed. So omega, right? Omega double dot, omega dot, omega homogeneous part. And then you have parts which depend on time, so non-homogeneous part. And we classically like to put it in the right-hand side, this non-homogeneous part. And if you remember your course, you often uh, use right-hand side to construct your particular solution and homogeneous part to construct your homogeneous family of solutions if you are solving uh, ODE. Right? So it makes sense It's uh, like uh, to put them like this. Omega on the left hand side, everything else on the right hand side. Standard, uh, standard stuff from mathematics. Okay, let's let's do it. So here in front of uh, uh, remember in front of omega double dot we will have one as before because the control law does not change omega double dot. It will never change the highest derivative as a rule. Okay. But now what we have is uh, in front of the omega dot instead of instead of a that was here right we have a plus b k d looks exactly like we what we saw previously right a plus b k d in front of omega we have c plus b k p again instead of c exactly as we saw before. Last slide, we saw again A was converted into A plus BKD, C was converted into C plus BKD, BKP. So nothing changes. Left-hand side stays exactly the same as before. That is a very important observation to make. That is a very important observation. In fact, uh, a reference signal does not change the homogeneous part of the, um, of the system. So introducing this reference tracking does not influence homogeneous solution of your resulting ODE. It only changes a particular solution. Uh, this mathematically is very pleasing. It's, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense since a reference is somehow itself a solution and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, for us as engineers, we could say that the most important part is that this analysis related to homogeneous part, to the part on the left-hand side, survives this change. So we don't need to redo this analysis. We can keep it in its entirety. That means stability remains the same. If I'm asking you to stabilize, it remains the same. Nothing changes. Your frequency response remains the same. Nothing changes. You can see how nice it is. Suddenly, we were able to go from just stabilizing the origin to stabilizing any point or even following a trajectory, so tracking, we were able to do it without sacrificing any of our analysis. Everything remained the same. This is the, one of the great uh, points about PID. You can design it in terms of performance metrics without knowing your signal. Of course, your performance metrics should <laughs> ideally correspond to the task you're trying to solve. For example, if your task is high-frequency task, it won't make any sense to uh, design your, um, uh, you know, your system to be uh, very uh, responding very badly to high frequencies, right? Like you, you, you have to know what kind of frequencies you expect 
before you can do frequency analysis uh, and design based on that, right? Uh, same as if your task requires uh, fast motion and you have big initial errors, maybe it wouldn't make sense to leave eigenvalues to be very small, right? When the decay takes forever, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to know your task before you decide what performance metrics you apply. But once you know your performance metrics, your uh, design does not have to ask anything about the reference signal. That is nice, important part of uh, PD control. Okay, good. So equation 12 told us this. But also what it told us is that we have this right-hand side, which we could uh, ignore in the design, but uh, it is there. Uh, and you know, it plays a role too, right? So we have this right-hand side, BKP times omega reference plus BKD omega reference dot, right? So it exists, it does something. It's not completely irrelevant, right? Okay, okay. In fact, what you can notice is that um, if your signal is very fast, uh, its derivative will be very big, and K KD, if it is also very big, would amplify it. And you remember what KD does, right? KD, uh, the bigger it is, the more damping you have. So the system would be less oscillatory, you can say. It would be more, um, you could say it would be more kind of like slow, Right, it will decay fast to zero. But here it is kind of playing the opposite role. It says very big KD means uh, if your signal changes fast, uh, this big derivative uh, omega r uh, dot will be multiplied by a big number. So you have a huge and uh, rapidly changing object there, which would influence uh, quite a lot what the system does, right? So you have to be careful that the right-hand side does not influence your analysis once you understand your performance metrics. But again, you have to be careful about your performance metrics themselves. Okay, all right. Now let's transfer this equation into Laplace form. Let's transfer all of this into Laplace domain. So the way we can do it is uh, like this. We replace omega double dot with C squared, omega dot with C, um, omega is one, and we have this uh, out of the brackets is C, uh, omega of C. So this is Laplace form of omega. So remember derivatives, uh, like second derivatives become C squared, first derivative C, zero derivative one, and you have omega C. Right? We've done it so many times, I'm not going to repeat it. But now right-hand side also is transformed, right? We have VR, V reference, omega reference of C. And here we have B times P, uh, sub, uh, K sub P, and B, K sub D times C. Sorry, S times S. My apologies. S, 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 S. Oh, this is S. OK. So. Right now, this was uh, would have been before we introduced reference. It would have been equal to zero, which would of course make it very difficult to say anything about transfer functions, for example, because the uh, right hand side was zero. Right, it's like a little bit strange. But now right hand side is not zero. The right hand side, in fact, is also a form with Laplace variables, and we can find a transfer function from a reference to omega, okay? How a reference becomes omega, right? Transfer function is basically, what do you need to multiply one signal to get another signal, right? So what do you need to multiply reference to get omega? That is a transfer function. As a transfer function, in this case, is this guy. It is B times K sub D times S plus B times K sub P. Where did this come from? Uh, the numerator, well, from here, right? This is, uh, how do we get the, how do we get this transfer function? We basically divide omega by VR, right? 
we get uh, and we um, isolated on the left hand side. So let me just graphically illustrate this. How do we get this uh, transfer function? We take this guy divided by uh, uh, by this guy, all right? So it will be here. Okay, and this is the first step. And then we want to isolate, isolate it on the left-hand side. So we take, uh, I guess, this guy and put it here. Uh, so on the right-hand side, divide by it, uh, both both equations, and we get this kind of stuff. And this is what you see uh, downstairs. So this is it. Right? All right. So that is it. Uh, just to finish color coding, this guy is here. Okay, okay. Now we have this transfer function, uh, W uh, sub R, which uh, has uh, on the uh, numerator uh, this blue stuff that came from reference signal in Laplace representation, and denominator, which came from the homogeneous part of the equation in the Laplace representation. OK, great. Looks very nice. Let's see what we can do with it. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, slide, uh, the slide edited the interesting part. So uh, since the slide edit, let me just, I hope to have a bit more this. Let me just uh, discuss it in, um, in, my, like, in my own language. Mm -hmm. So. What we can do with this is, of course, everything that we do with transfer functions. So for example, pole placement, right? Uh, but notice if we do pole placement, what we work with is actually this part of the equation, right? Poles, poles are uh, solutions for the denominator of the transfer function. So poles are solutions to this quadratic polynomial. But you know what it is. Uh, solutions to these quadratic polynomials are roots of uh, characteristic equation, are eigenvalues of the system. We proved it last time. So if we do pole placement, it will be, uh, we go back to the analysis of second order system. It, it is completely equivalent. And we showed one example of how to do it with uh, OD, right? But uh, there are so many pole placement methods. I don't have to... Uh, you know, propose any particular one. We have a lot. What we also could do is we could look at the uh, zeros of the equation. You know, in control theory, we talk about poles and zeros. So zeros are solutions to the numerator uh, of the system, right? And uh, so in particular, they're here, right? solutions of the numerator. And some stability criteria, especially graphic uh, graphic ones deal with both nulls and zeros, right? Sorry, but was zeros and poles, poles and zeros. And now you can understand where exactly the zeros come from. They come from the reference signal. So when you do use PD control with reference signal, uh, this reference signal uh, times the PD controller basically will become uh, go upstairs. So uh, what is important here is that transfer function will have this very specific structure. Uh, it would have, it would not be random, right? It would have this block here, which would be repeated uh, here, right? So uh, it would be repeated here, right? And exact, uh, exactly the same as this block here would be repeated here, right? So there will be repeated blocks, same blocks in the uh, upper part and the lower part, like uh, numerator and denominator. Nice, uh, good. And uh, we, uh, we could do analysis of, uh, you know, analysis of zeros and um, poles. But also what is, uh, again, quite important, I think, and quite interesting, is that the reference signal itself, so how, how it looks like, etc., does not appear anywhere. Like where is the reference signal here? It, it, there isn't, it is none. Like you don't see a reference signal in this transfer function. What you see is only the controller and dynamics plus controller. That is it. You don't see a reference signal. Uh, reference signal is left 
uh, because it, it basically we stopped talking about a reference signal itself. We started to talk about transfer functions that transforms it. Okay, so this uh, again uh, is yet another way to avoid um, avoid thinking about complexities of many possible reference signals that you can experience. Instead, we simply talk about our uh, uh, transfer function, which depends on the controller. So yet another nice property of PD control that even uh, zeros are also uh, dependent on, on our control. Right. Right. Quite good. Quite good. OK. Now uh, let us move on. And here we are coming close to finally uh, seeing PID, right? Before we saw PD, all of this was PD. Now we will see a little bit of PID in just a second. But first I need to motivate why we need it, right? So let's consider DC motor with additive disturbance, additive disturbance, okay? So here's again our DC motor. Right? Remember this is the equation of DC motor. And here's, uh, you know, right hand side, everything is as before, except we have this disturbance D here. Disturbance D. I guess I should write it as D0 because we are going to change it to D after we divide by GA. Okay. So after we do exact same thing as before, divide everything by G, uh, JL, we get our you know nice looking equation with like you know, a one in front of higher derivative, uh, nice coefficients here. And this equation will have again d, right? Uh, th this was d zero. This is just d. Okay, so. What is the disturbance? Uh, before we continue, let's just ask, what is the disturbance? Well, disturbance can be gravity. If you have uh, your motor keeping steady at a position where you have a gravity force acting on the payload, it can produce a constant, uh, constant torque, which influences you. So it can be like just a gravity. Uh, Basically, it's just a constant term as equations, right? So uh, if you are talking about like a constant position, um, sure, it can be gravity. Of course, uh, constant position does make a lot of sense when we have this, you know, omega here. Supposedly, it is not zero. So you could say, how is gravity can act like this? But it would make perfect sense in uh, angle control. All right, what about omega? What can be d in omega? Well, it maybe it can be a component of uh, friction. So when, once, once you move, you have a friction which is proportional to the velocity, but you have a constant component, which is, is somehow is just constant, doesn't change. So you, like your friction never goes exactly to zero. In fact, it goes to some value, right? This again is uh, like, you can object to it. You can say, uh, wouldn't it, this friction uh, do work, and you have to, uh, of course, to avoid it making work, you have to somehow uh, model it on ranges of velocities and so on. Fine. Um, it, it, there can be uh, other sources of um, additive disturbance. Can be, for example, you compute your payload and uh, wrote everything, you know, correctly and so on. But then there is a comp like some constant component of your dynamics which you didn't account for, right? And appears as a disturbance here. Um, those things are everywhere. Constant disturbances. The uh, disturbances which are not constant are even more popular. But we will start with a constant one. Okay. So uh, they everywhere, and, and uh, they have to do with the fact that it's very difficult to model your robot precisely. They have uh, also have to do with the fact that often something is non-perfect, like you have a dry friction somewhere. Something is not perfect, you have asymmetry somewhere in the, uh, gravity force acts. Uh, often things are bending, uh, changing shape, and so on. And all of this leads to 
discrepancy between the model and reality. And this discrepancy, if you are very lucky, would be constant. Okay. Often you are unlucky and this time dependent or even worse, state dependent. But uh, you know, can be uh, constant. So let's just assume that this constant. We'll oh, take one step at a time. Simplest case, D is constant. Okay. All right. So I have additive disturbance D. Now, what do we do with it? Like, if we just leave it alone, uh, what will happen is after you substitute, uh, do all those steps, we'll get our equation. For example, let's look here. We'll get our equation, which would look, let's say, like this. Right. Let me uh, uh, make it look like this. But on the left, you will still have zero, you will have D. Okay. If we just do like uh, this control law into the system, but you had plus D here, right? Plus D. Unless I'm uh, mistaken, you would have here instead of zero, you would have D. Right? This is not exactly what we want. We don't want D on the right, because what it would mean is that we convert to zero but to something which is a function of D. Okay. So somehow a disturbance decides where we converge. We don't want to give disturbance this much power or what our robot does. And with the gravity, I like this example because it is so clear. Imagine you just design your perfect control law, which has to move your robot arm from this position to this position, right? It's just horizontal motion, okay? And it moves it perfectly. You go zero degrees to 25 degrees, just perfectly goes 25, zero, zero, 25. Excellent, no problems. Next you say, okay, let's uh, use this arm for practical application, but in practical application, it is vertical, okay? And now you go from zero to 25, zero to 25. But what happens is at zero, you have a very high gravity force. So in fact, instead of horizontal position, you go some, something like this, right? You go minus five for some reason. And instead of going 25, you go to 24. Gravity is less there. So you go from minus five, 24, minus five, 24. Because the gravity uh, does something bad to you. Completely unacceptable, right? In, in, in terms of engineering, now we can uh, all agree that this is absolutely not what we can accept as a result, right? We want to combat with it. And this is why I like this example so much is if you, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how much you worked in the lab and so on, but if you did, uh, the chances are you saw this in practice. It is so easy to make um, a robot like this where everything is fine, but because of some external force, it is kind of slogging, you know, so it just doesn't, doesn't want to track the trajectory. Okay, okay. So I uh, hope I convinced you that this D is a problem. We cannot just ignore it. Now, uh, I propose to introduce a PID control law, PID control law. To solve this problem, we'll use PID control law. And it will look like this, U equals to minus KD times omega dot, minus KP times omega, minus ki times integral. So and here, let me, I guess, give you careful, uh, careful analysis. ki times integral from zero to t. So the same t as here, okay? Same t as here, same t as here. So from zero to the current time of omega tau d tau, right? So tau is the internal variable, but uh, integral will be from zero to t. This is a PID control law, okay? Uh, looks very nice, looks very nice, but also looks a little bit scary. So I will just give you a second to look at it. Right. Now, uh, we can define phi, right, phi such that derivative of phi is omega, right? And derivative of phi is omega. That would mean that this becomes 
phi double dot. So this is phi double dot, right? Minus times kd. This becomes phi dot times kp. This, if you can trust me, becomes phi. So this is a leap of faith, okay? This is a leap of faith. Uh, in fact, if I defined this to be equal to phi, that would be entirely correct. That would be entirely correct, I think. So uh, here is a better way to define phi would be to say, let's let this to be equal to phi, and then the derivative will be, like we could show the derivative is equal to omega, right? Okay, but uh, uh, the, the difference is, of course, comes at uh, like constant terms, stuff like this. Right. All right, all right. Because you can imagine like not every signal that uh, whose derivative is equal to omega would be equal to uh, this integral because you know we have this like zero here and so on. And we don't have a constant term. Okay. Okay. Now, okay, we have this uh, control law and it is now written in terms of phi. So now it is like the, the same thing, but now no integral. It is just a second order equation, right? Second order systems, we studied them quite a bit in this course. We now feel quite confident that we can do anything with this uh, signal. Okay, let's con you know add this to our dynamics. So uh, what happens is we have our old dynamics here. Just notice that in the old dynamics, we have phi triple dot instead of omega double dot, phi double dot instead of omega dot, phi dot instead of omega. We have our old d, so d doesn't change. Also, we have our b, right? But now we add our controller, which would be, you know, kd phi double dot, with minus sign, of course, kp phi dot with minus sign, ki phi here, all right? Great, sounds very nice, sounds very nice. Now, grouping the terms, we get this uh, guy. So a plus b kd, uh, this, of course, you know, this a and this kd, right? Same uh, for every other, uh, so we have same way C plus BKP and BKI. BKI doesn't have an analog here. So uh, important to recognize this guy does not have an analog here, right? Phi is only on the right-hand side. It doesn't have anything on the left-hand side, which is phi. Because we basically, we lifted the signal system into a higher order. It was second order system, we made it third order system. So it doesn't have the lowest rank derivative naturally. It only obtained it through our lift. So it will be in control law, but it cannot be in the homogeneous part uh, that we had previously, right? New homogeneous part has phi, but it is only a function of ki. Okay, nice. So now we have this very nice uh, pretty system, third order with uh, coefficients grouped. Very good. Let's uh, see what we can do with it. So what we can do with it is the following. Let us hope that we can make steady state of this equation. Right? So once steady state of the of this guy to be equal to Sorry, Zoom, we changed the interface, so it's now very difficult to draw. <laughs> so it, uh, now we uh, change the steady state into this new guy. Um, what is this guy? This is basically this thing here. So what I propose is let us make, make it so the steady state of this equation is bki phi equal to d. Okay? So this will be the steady state 
this is what we want the steady state to be like. Phi ki b ki phi phi equal to d. All right. So the steady state value of phi would then have to be d divided by b ki. All right, fair enough. So this is what we want. This is not what we have, it's what we want. Uh, okay, so let's say this is this is true. Well, notice that steady state would have obviously omega equal to zero, right? Because you know the for a steady state, this guy absolutely has to be zero. This has to be zero, this has to be zero. So it means that omega would be zero. But notice what we did just here. Uh, what we did is we made sure that the original variables tend to zero. They don't tend somewhere. They tend to zero. All right. So the new variable tends to something like uh, phi tends to d over b ki. Fine. We don't care. We care about our original variable omega, which is what we wanted to control. And it will tend to zero. If the system is stable, so the system has to be stable. If it is unstable, discussion of control uh, is uh, meaningless because unstable system will just go somewhere. It, we have to make it stable, absolutely, in terms of eigenvalues and so on. But if it is stable uh, and steady state is like this, well, it would mean that uh, omega will tend to zero, right? and that is uh, exactly what we wanted, and that is what we couldn't have before. Remember, if we substituted control law, PD control law into our equation, we would have d on the right hand side, which means that st steady state in terms of omega would be omega equal to d times something. So before we would have had a constant rotation, if you think of omega as uh, angle velocity, we would have a constant rotation because it's constant d disturbance. Now we wouldn't have it because uh, steady state would be static phi. All right. And this is the idea of the integral part. The idea of the integral part of uh, PID control is that once you substitute into the equation, equation becomes higher order equation. But the steady state of this new higher order equation contains zero in terms of the old variables. So old variables, which are low, like higher order now, they all become like derivatives, second derivative, third derivatives, etc. Um, in particular, the variables you care about would be first derivative in new variables. Its steady state would be zero. Uh, zero right? So if you stabilize this higher order system, the variables you wanted to drive to zero will go to zero because now it was it, it is phi, phi dot, right? Before it was omega, and it wouldn't, the steady state would be omega equal to something. Now it is phi dot, and steady state would be omega equal to zero as long as the system is stable. All right, all right. And notice, uh, if the system is stable, it also is the fact that this is zero, right? This is zero, this is zero. So in fact, this steady state is not simply something we want, it's also something we have. So somehow it's not just what we could achieve by some tricks or machinations. We would just have it as long as we achieve stability of the overall system. So all we have to do now is to make sure that this third order system is stable. Of course, we cannot do it by uh, analysis that we did for second order systems. We have to do either new analysis for third order systems, which is more complicated, or we can rely on linear control theory spot placement, LQR, any of that. And then we could do um, stability of the system in state space, for example. All right, good. Now, uh, PID control in Laplace domain looks like this. So we have U of C is equal to K sub D S. So this is the derivative part. Kp, this is proportional part, and Ki divided by S, this is the integral part. 
not, remember that one over s is a classical Laplace representation of integral. S is a, cla a classical Laplace representation of a derivative. Right? So the transfer function in PID case will be um, high order. So notice the right hand side here becomes S cubed A plus B KD S squared C plus B KP S plus B K I. So as we saw, dynamics became higher order. So the denominator would also be higher order. And the numerator is also higher order. It is KD S squared plus KP S plus K I. Okay. Both of them are higher order. So that means uh, both roots and zeros will be more. There will be three roots, two zeros. Okay, this B appears here because uh, you know the upper part of the right hand side is multiplied by B. Okay, let me just see if I have more slides. Okay, I have. I have. So uh, we don't have to do it in terms of velocities, right? We can do it also in terms of orientation, right? So let's say that is more typical, I think, for a lot of robotics application. Instead of controlling how fast the motor is rotating, which it would be, for example, typical for a quadrotor, like a lower control loop for a quadrotor would often be uh, in terms of velocity. But for uh, robots, uh, it's, we often want just position. We want the shaft to be oriented in some way. So let's write dynamics of the motor in terms of the shaft position phi, right? Same phi variable as before. So in, in terms of this variable, we could write it as a transfer function. Here, directly wrote it as a transfer function. Notice we have um, third order transfer function. It doesn't have a first order term because orientation of the shaft does not influence the dynamics in any way. If if this is somehow like not feels like it has too many steps, uh, you can retrace what I did in the previous slides. Just uh, change variables to the way I did for PID control. You derive to this very fast. So, is a, if you feel like this is not clear, consider this a very good exercise to try to derive this formula twenty five on your own using uh, methods for, that I displayed in this lecture. It is easy enough. And it was a good exercise. So I will leave it uh, here. This is a transfer function for motor in terms of angles. Now, we can do PID control, which would in state a Laplace form. Uh, I saw, I, sorry, I showed it. Uh, it looked uh, this way like KD times S, KP, KI divided by S. And I even have here a reference tracking, right? So a reference angle minus. Current angle. Okay, so this is our PID control with the reference signal. Sounds very advanced, right? We do reference tracking for PID control, and we do angles instead of angular velocities. So many things advanced, right? So what we can do is we can substitute this guy into here, right? We substitute it into here. Um, I, uh, for some reason, we have, oh, sorry, into here. I know, I'm not sure where B event here is a uh, mistake. I guess the best way to fix it is like this. Let me use this. We already have this equation. Right? All right. So we can substitute it. And what we have is this cont um, What we have is this control law U is here, right? Uh, once we substitute it, uh, of course, like this, SI will go downstairs, but there will be exact same SI in front of this guy. It will go upstairs. So both equations will gain in their, um, in their degree. So notice before we, like when we originally talked about PID, we first went from first order equation, oh, sorry, second order equation to the third order equation, right? And we worked in new variables, so we didn't have integral parts. Here I have integral parts, but it results in the exact same transfer function. Why? Because this 
as in the denominator, we will just go to numerator and vice versa from the S in the numerator, it will go down. So it will be all the same story. Nothing will change. And uh, here, uh, the way the reason I did it all in all plus variables is because I didn't want to introduce yet another variable which would be like integral of a angle, right? I didn't want to introduce it and I didn't have to. So that's why we don't have it here. Now, after all these machinations, what we will have is uh, control law here that comes from the reference signal. Remember, uh, what is in the numerator, in the PID or PD, is uh, basically a reference, uh, what is in front of the reference signal. That is how transfer functions work. Right? What is in the denominator, uh, this whole guy, is basically our original dynamics, right? plus uh, our control law. Uh, just the terms are aggregated. So you can see the terms are aggregated, right? As usual, you have one in front of uh, the higher order derivative. This time, this time you have A in front of this guy. You have this, this, this. Uh, not 100% sure that this is correct, by the way. So in case you find a mistake, please correct it for me. Uh, or such suggest a correction. So I'll just give it, I will leave it at that. But uh, in, if, if there are mistakes here, the, uh, please uh, correct me. This is one of those slides that I uh, uh, present for the first time. So there weren't mistakes. And uh, what is interesting again is uh, you, you could do all this math. It is just uh, quite simple. All right, all right. Uh, so uh, the important part here is that the resulting transfer function will be fourth order transfer function in the denominator and second order in the numerator. So it have four poles, three, uh, uh, three, sorry, two uh, zeros, right? Four poles, uh, because you have third order dynamics in the first place, in, in terms of angle, it is third order. And you have uh, the uh, second, uh, second order dynamics in terms of your uh, controller, right? And they are shifted. Like this controller is it is third order, but it is integral variable, which increases the overall number of um, uh, overall um, degree of the polynomials. All right, so this is this is what happens, and ultimately this is all uh, that I want uh, to say about the this case, like it, it looks complicated and you would have, to, like in practice, you would have to worry about things like roots of this polynomial, how you, can you analyze it analytically or would you have to rely on numerical methods? Uh, it would be very nice if you can decompose this polynomial into something nice like sum of squares or anything like that. If you cannot, then again, you have worries. Uh, fourth order the polynomial, you can still solve analytically, I believe. Uh, not that I ever tried to do it uh, by hand. But uh, you know, there are possibilities, and you definitely can easily solve it numerically. But again, analysis becomes even more complicated. We did analysis for the second order polynomial. Here you have to do it somehow for the fourth order polynomial. Does not sound super fun. Uh, but uh, you, you can do it. And uh, ultimately, this is, uh, you know, you have tools that would automatically tune your controller for your uh, transfer function, you know, you give a transfer function, it will tune your control. Fourth order transfer functions are nothing too scary for modern computers and so on. So there is nothing too too difficult about this uh, PID control. Um, one trick that we used here to arrive at this equation is, uh, by the way, we took transfer function for e omega and then we integrated it, right? So integrated, it means multiplied by one over S. That's why we have higher order uh, things here. So this is like one step that I did in the direction. So this is it. You, you, what I, I guess what I want to uh, like final words on this, uh, what I want to say is um, PID uh, in terms of mathematics, even this complicated case, um, the, the only complexity here is to just not make a mistake, right? That's it. There is no intellectual complexity, much of intellectual complexity here. Like the transfer function is same, like we have a transfer function for omega, 
how do you get from trans function for omega trans function for phi? Well, you integrate omega to get phi. Uh, what is integration in Laplace? One over s, right? That's how you arrive here. Well, uh, what is the uh, u like PID? Well, it is literally this. I just re literally re took a definition of PID, wrote it in Laplace domain, right? How do we add a reference signal? Or oh, by definition, like this, right? So there's again like nothing here complicated here. And then we substitute this guy into this guy, and we get this expression. Like we, of course, we uh, trans function will be to write trans function. You always have to uh, have one signal on the left, one signal on the right with the trans function and multiplying it. That's it. So uh, that is my message. It is simple. <laughs> there is nothing uh, nothing complicated with it. And uh, the whole trick of uh, PID control, as I said before, was that your steady state would be this nice. Like your steady state in new variable would be something which you don't care about. And in terms of the old variable, it would be zero. I think uh, if an engineer would uh, discuss, uh, or you know, practitioner from the like student lab would describe how PID control works, it would tell you something like this. This new variable phi, or if you want this whole integral here, kind of accumulates error. It adds error up. It's, it collects it, collects it, collects it, collects it. And it, when your uh, robot arm was sogging under gravity, let's say it was sogging under gravity like this. Remember, uh, it, it's supposed to go like this, right? But goes kind of like this because of gravity, right? So let's say it's sogging under gravity. What this uh, what this controller would do, this uh, integral part, it would uh, see, okay, I'm, I have an error. I, I, I integrate. I have error, still have error. I integrate. I still have error. I integrate. As time goes on, this integral part will uh, you know, become bigger and bigger and bigger, and you would eventually kind of go like this. Because the integral part will kind of accumulate this error, and over time, it will compensate it perfectly. Uh, it will stop accumulating error uh, as soon as you reach this position. So this would be the way it would be represented uh, on this uh, kind of intuitive level. It would just accumulate error and then uh, compensate perfectly. The only downside of this explanation is that it is not clear how it works when you have a trajectory. Like you have a trajectory, everything goes like this, like this, and you have accumulate error from like 15 minutes ago. What is going on? And in practice, people don't like those old errors. So often enough, people would say, my PID control would have a factor which would discard older accumulations. I would, uh, the older my part of you know, error histories that I have, the less I value it. So I'd multiply it by factor, uh, or just go set it to zero, and so on and so forth. So uh, this integral part is not uh, for engineers. It's not always kind of like just integrate from zero to current time, right? Not always. But uh, from mathematical perspective, and I think this is uh, important to understand before you go into engineering, what happens is just this. You just have this integral part. When you uh, use it, it lifts up your equation one degree up. You have a steady state, which is possible now, which steady state makes your new variable not zero, right? It is something. But the old variable is zero because there's a steady state, right? Because old variable is now derivative of the new one. And for the new one to be static, the old one has to be zero. That is the principle behind PID. Okay, the rest is just, you know, uh, just to work, just a little bit of sweat on trying to uh, transfer everything in Laplace or state, state space, whichever you prefer. You can do state space, state space Laplace, or D, and use your favorite method for placement or uh, something else, LQR, to tune those coefficients. OK, this is it uh, for me. Uh, this is it for um, this uh, section on stability and control. We will, we're not going to go far away from it. Next week, we just shift a little bit to, towards some of the practical aspects that we can now discuss. Now that we understand control and its implications, we can now go back to some of the practical matters that we absolutely have to know. 
Next week we'll have uh, uh, we'll talk about reducers, gearboxes, transmissions, and after that we will start in talking about sensors. So those things are quite related uh, to control, absolutely related to models. We have to understand them, uh, and especially effects such as drive friction and so on, which make things hard, nonlinear, and uh, ultimately often uh, too hard to work with. Right. So we have to uh, understand those effects, right? Then uh, if you have questions, you can ask. I'll stop the recording here.